In this video, I'm going to talk about some applications of second order linear ODEs with constant coefficients and an inhomogeneous term. <clears throat> so we'll call that solo decky, I guess. Okay, so the first uh, application I'm going to talk about is uh, vibrations, mechanical vibrations. And I'll start off just with a very simple model and hand wave my way into justifying that this is actually a fairly uh, broad a model, broad application. So uh, I'll start off with the mass spring system. This is the simplest uh, system that gives us a second order linear ODE with constant coefficients and an inhomogeneous term as long as there's an external forcing. If there's no external forcing, then we don't get that inhomogeneous term. Okay, so mass, oops, mass spring systems. And so uh, what I mean by that is, here's the cartoon version. If you have, let's say, a wall and a spring attached to the wall, and then attached at the end of the spring, you have a mass. And we characterize a spring as having some stiffness k, and the mass having a mass m. Okay, uh, so the geometry here makes it look like that spring will just flop over. Let's just assume we're in uh, an environment where there's no gravity or uh, it's just supported by a table underneath. Or you can also do this hanging from the ceiling, but then you get a slightly different uh, version of the equation uh, because of the gravitational force. So I'm just going to keep it simple. Um, and <clears throat> the observation here is that the energy, the potential energy of a system like this is going to be one half k times x minus x naught squared. And what is x naught? So let me move this out of the way. We'll put the m up here. x naught is the rest position where the spring is neither compressed nor stretched. So the idea there is that you, if you stretch the spring a little bit, you increase the position of the tip. So this is x the position of the mass. And right now that mass is located at x naught, so the energy is zero. As you stretch it, the energy is going to go up quadratically in either direction, stretch or squish. So this is uh, axis here is the position of the mass, and this is the energy that it has. Now the force that acts on an object is going to be given by minus the spatial derivative of the energy. So in other words, the slope in this picture with a negative sign in front. So that force is going to be minus k times x minus x naught. Now it's not, it's not the norm that uh, potentials like this would be just squared so that the force is linear, but the idea is that as long as, it, you know, this energy might be nonlinear and crazy out here, or non-quadratic, crazy out there, but if you're near what we call a rest position, it should locally be quadratic, and we approximate that more complicated energy function by a quadratic under the assumption that we're, we're never going to really leave a small interval around that point. Uh, x naught. Okay, so um, so that's the basic setup. Now we have to refer back to Newton. What did Newton say? He said that the mass times the acceleration of the object is equal to the sum of the forces acting on it. And in this case, we have only one force. If it were hanging from the ceiling, we'd have an extra force, a gravitational force, and that would only make a small change. But this is the simple case. So we have minus kx minus x naught. And the acceleration in this case is going to be given by the second derivative of the position, as always. And so what we have now is minus kx minus x naught on this side. And if we want to put this into our usual ODE, second order ODE form, I have to multiply that k through and I get mx double prime plus kx is equal to kx naught. And that is a second order differential equation for x with constant coefficients and an inhomogeneous term because this k times x naught is a fixed constant. Okay, so that is our simplest um, mass spring system. 
Um, and so some of the things that you can use this as you know, a model for, so, um, and this is a slightly oversimplification, molecular bonds. So this is kind of a, I'm going to show you a classical view of molecular bonds. There's a more complicated and more accurate way of describing them that requires quantum description, but I'll avoid that for now. So um, there's something called a Morse potential, which describes the energy stored in the bond. And I'm going to draw the bond as a spring here. And so um, the Morse potential is something that looks like this. It has an asymptote at zero, and then it gradually approaches zero as, you, as x goes to infinity. So that is the Morse potential, and that's a potential that, as you see, if you squish the masses or the, the molecules on either side of that bond together, you end up with a huge energy stored. So it's very difficult to get those together. And that's, you know, that's, there's, there's physical uh, phenomena that explain that um, it's very extremely strong with storing force. And so as you increase the length of the bond or let it relax back, you get to a spot where you're at the bottom of a well and that will be your rest potential. And then if you continue it, you get out to a place where the energy essentially flattens out, and out here, you're, you've effectively broken the bond. Because the energy is flat and the two molecules, they're no longer attached by any kind of spring, they just don't even feel each other. You can move them around as much as you want and there's essentially no difference in their energy. And so this scenario, if we approximate the Morse potential by a quadratic function, we get something that is exactly like this scenario back here. And this is, this I would call this a classical harmonic oscillator. So harmonic meaning the energy is quadratic and classical meaning it's not quantum. In other words, we don't have to appeal to Schrodinger's equation to describe it. Of course, we lose uh, discrete energy levels and things like that, but at least we have a simple model for the way molecules react to forces. Okay, so um, how does this scale up? So imagine you had a long, thin rod, like a beam in a building, or a, for example, a microtubule in cellular biology. Both of these can be described as a whole bunch of individual units, let's say molecules, of this type here, or uh, proteins in the microtubule case, and they form some kind of a crystal lattice. They're all packed together, and every one of these is bound to its neighbors by a bond that has, let's say, locally near its rests position, it has a quadratic energy. And so if you have one of these long enough, and you apply a reasonable scale force to these, so imagine I bend, I push down here and I fix this end against some supporting object. Then I'll get a deflection and the extent of this deflection X is going to have a restoring, there's gonna be a restoring force because we're bending a whole bunch of springs on the bottom edge of this and we're stretching a whole bunch of springs on the top edge. And those two forces in combination lead to a net restoring force that pushes back in this direction. And the equation that you get from that is almost a slightly different interpretation for the constants, but it's very closely related to this equation. And it's for small deflections, it's a good approximation. So yet again, we get uh, a simple harmonic behavior. And if you've ever tapped a tuning fork, that's exactly what's going on. You get a pure tone because you get uh, an, some kind of a vibration out of a mechanical oscillator, a, like a classical harmonic oscillator, at least for small deformations. So don't hit your tuning fork too hard, and this works. Okay, so um, there's a slight m complication that we can add to this. This is a very idealized case 
where you'll notice there's no loss of energy in this model. Okay, there's um, there if you you could you can multiply through by x prime on this, and you if you integrate up, what you get is you get one half m x prime squared plus the spring energy stored is one half k uh, x minus x naught squared. And that is equal to constants. And this means that there's some, um, some total energy, which is not just the potential E, but it's uh, some total energy that is unchanging in time. So that means that we're not losing any energy. But there's a, a, another way of modeling these slightly more complicated, where we take the same wall with a spring attached to it, and we attach making it larger just because I need room to represent the th this additional thing that's going to allow for me to dissipate energy. And this is called a dash pot. And so it's imagine a piston with, let's say, thick fluid in it or um, something that resists the movement of the object. So we still have a mass m here. We still have a spring constant k there. And I'm going to call this gamma. And the this object is called a dash pot. Oops, not mod. <laughs> dash pot. And how does that appear in the equations? I have m times a is equal to minus k x minus x naught minus gamma times v. So in other words, it's a viscous object that when you move it, there's a force that it exerts on the moving object that is proportional to the velocity and in the opposite direction. So proportional to velocity, but in the opposite direction. And that's the force I get of it, so that's why there's a minus sign there. And so when I translate this and simplify it down, I get mx double prime plus gamma x prime, when I bring that uh, v term over to the left side, plus kx equal kx naught. And because kx naught is a constant, I can always make the substitution x y equal x minus x naught, which, if you go through that substitution, the derivative of y is the same as the derivative of x, so these terms don't change. And then this term here and this term here together turn into a y with a k in front of it, and then it becomes a homogeneous equation. So the, um, the model that we now are looking at, as long as we measure position zero as the rest position, then we get these second order linear differential equations with constant coefficients and they're homogeneous. In order to get a non-homogeneous term, we would have to apply some force to the object, and an additional force will get added in here at the end. So that's how we get these solo decky. Okay, uh, I'll go on with some uh, examples of how this leads to interesting dynamics and in particular resonance in another video.